Well, good morning, God's peace to you. It's wonderful again to see all of you here as we gather together to worship, and I pray that your time here this morning will be a blessing to you. We're going to continue. Uh, we're not going to continue. We ended our, our series on the walk last week. We're going to start a new series going through the book of Nehemiah. And I think this is going to be a really uh, interesting and impactful study of God's Word since Nehemiah occupies a place in the Bible that maybe is not the most familiar to us. So it'll be interesting in that regard. We'll get to learn a little bit more about this uncharted territory in Scripture. And then I also think it's going to be impactful because Nehemiah was doing something that all of us at one point in our lives or certainly churches go through and even families and cultures, he was going through a rebuilding and restoring process. I bet you can imagine times in your life right now, you can think of times in your life right now where you had to go through that kind of process. There need to be restoration, there need to be rebuilding. And Nehemiah is at that place in Israel's history uh, Nehemiah comes to us at a time when Israel has experienced the judgment of God, where the tribes of Judah are the only tribes left because the Assyrians have sacked the northern tribes and taken them off into captivity, never to be seen again. The tribes of Judah and Benjamin are left, but then not long after that, the Babylonians come through and they take the tribes of Judah into captivity, down into Babylon. And there you can read in the Old Testament about experiences of, of those in captivity like Daniel. Or you can read about those who continued in that captivity after the Babylonians were gone, the Persians came through. And you read the books of Esther. And you learn that God's people still faced a world of challenge, a world that, that wasn't in their favor. And in the midst of that challenge, they continued to seek God. During this period, what we sometimes call uh, the exile and the, the post-exilic period or the restoration period of Israel's history, we find that, that it's during this time that synagogue worship began. You can read all throughout the Old Testament. You're not going to read about synagogues. Read the law of Moses. They're not in there. They were an expedience that had to be developed or, or by circumstance were developed during the exile. What were the Jews to do? They couldn't go worship at the temple like they had been doing for all the centuries preceding. They were not allowed to do that. So what did they do? They created the synagogue system. And they would worship together on the Sabbath. When you open the pages of the New Testament, it's all over the place. Synagogue worship. It had become a fixture of Jewish culture and religion. But it's something that developed during the exile because they had to do that. They couldn't go to the temple. They were removed from their homeland. And during that time, they experienced uh, what the prophets had said would come because of their their rejection of God and their acceptance of idol worship. In fact, that's the thing that the prophets Isaiah uh, and the prophets Jeremiah really, really uh, hone in on is the fact that God's people who worship the one true and living God, the one who taught them in the Ten Commandments, there is no God before me, they were worshiping at the foot of altars erected to idols. They were turning to the gods of the people in the land and not worshiping the one true God. And as a result, of course, they were ethically and morally in sin. They did not follow the law when it came to, to worship, and so they didn't follow the law when it came to how they were to treat one another and, and doing justice to one another. And so God says by the prophets, there's going to come a time when you are removed from the land. And the land's going to get a little bit of a Sabbath from you, God says. 
you're going to be taken into captivity for 70 years. Now, Nehemiah comes along, it's been just about 70 years. Now, just to help us out, we're going to, we're going to start with the first chapter in Nehemiah, verse 1, where there it says, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital. Now, if you read Esther, you know that's where the context of Esther's book takes place, in Susa, under the Persian king Artaxerxes. At the end of Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 11, it says, At that time, I was cupbearer to the king. Now, a lot of folks will debate, you'll see in some uh, Bibles, study Bibles and things like that, that Ezra and Nehemiah were originally one book. And then uh, later on in, in church history, those books were separated into two books. And one of the reasons is when you start reading the book of Nehemiah, it looks like he's writing in first person, autobiography. Whereas Ezra seems to be uh, writing in his book, they're both contemporaries or near the same time. They seem to be writing uh, kind of autobiographies or first person. So that's why it was separated in, in your Bibles today. There's the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah. It does look to me that Nehemiah is giving his own account of what happened. So let's, let's jump in, but let's first set the, the background, the setting, because I know some of you, are, maybe this is the first time you've heard of Nehemiah, or it's been a long time, or it's just not very familiar. So if we look at a Bible timeline of this period, the restoration post-exilic period, I don't know if you can read that very well, but you see the exile takes place uh, around 586 BC. That's when the Babylonians come in to take the tribes of Judah. Before that, in 722 BC, you had the Assyrian uh, captivity of the northern tribes. The northern tribes are never restored to Israel. There's lots of people today, uh, you know, especially, uh, you know, what do, what do you call them? I don't know. Uh, fantasy writers, um, conspiratorial folks who think they've found the lost 10 tribes of Israel in some tribe somewhere or on some hiding out somewhere, uh, but they've never been found. They've been, uh, they were assimilated into the, the cultures. They were taken into captivity. They were never restored. The Babylonians, on the other hand, they took the tribes of Judah and Benjamin um, into Babylon and they were able to contain their culture there. They became ghettoized in a sense. So you had that community continue. That's how they were able to develop synagogue worship and things like that. Now, this all starts in 722 for the Assyrian captivities. And there were several waves of captivity. In 586, you have the Babylonian captivity that starts. But it's not like everybody at once was just dragged off to Babylon. There were several waves of captivity. Finally, concluding around 606 B.C., so uh, or that's when it starts, uh, 606 B.C. down to about 586 B.C. And then after that 70-year period, somewhere around 538, 536 B.C., you have no longer the Babylonians in charge. King Nebuchadnezzar is long gone. Now you have the Persians in charge. There's a new king named Cyrus. And he issues a decree to restore the Jews back to Israel. So you have this first wave of restoration under a governor selected by King Cyrus named Zerubbabel, which I just think is fun to say, Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel is, is the one that starts the, the first wave of restoration back. But then there's another wave of restoration in about 620 BC under the priest Ezra. And that's where, if you read the book of Ezra, you'll learn about his role in the restoration process. Finally, we get to Nehemiah. Nehemiah is at the end of the restoration process, around 445 B.C., in the third and last wave of exiles returned back to Jerusalem. So that just gives you kind of an orientation of where we're at in the Bible, where we're at in uh, biblical history as we consider the book of Nehemiah. Now, I mentioned King Cyrus so let's go to the, the next slide there, Reagan. Uh, the Persian kings are essential to understanding what's going on in the restoration period. And Cyrus is at the top of the list. King Cyrus was, was prophesied about by Isaiah that he would be born and he would be named Cyrus and that he would decree 
the return of the Israelites to their homeland. So remember, there's going to be this 70-year period, 70 period of exile, and that exile is going to be ended by a king named Cyrus who had not yet been born. King Cyrus was born around 590 to 580 B.C. Isaiah prophesied around 700 B.C. So, you know, you can do the math. Uh, Isaiah 45, the particular text uh, that deals with Cyrus, was written at least 80 to 100 years before Cyrus was even born. Let's go ahead and look at that text in uh, Isaiah chapter 45. There, verses 1 through 13, the scripture says, This is what the Lord says to Cyrus, his anointed one, whose right hand he will empower. Before him, mighty kings will be paralyzed with fear. Their fortress gates will be open, never to shut again. This is what the Lord says. I will go before you, Cyrus, and level the mountains. I will smash down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. And I will give you treasures hidden in the darkness, secret riches. I will do this for you. I will do this so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, the one who calls you by name. And why have I called you for this work? Why did I call you by name when, I, when you didn't know me? It is for the sake of Jacob, my servant, Israel, my chosen one. I am the Lord. There is no other God. I have equipped you for battle. Though you don't even know me, so all the world from east to west will know there is no other God. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I create the light and make the darkness. I send good times and bad times. I, the Lord, am the one who does these things. It's an amazing, amazing prophecy. He concludes by saying, open up, O heavens, and pour out your righteousness. Let the earth open wide so salvation and righteousness can sprout up together. I, the Lord, created them. Now, Isaiah prophesies of Cyrus a hundred years before he's born and calls him out by name. By name. Now, after Cyrus is born, he becomes aware of this prophecy. And he realizes it's about him. Can you imagine if you were born and your parents gave you a name and then you got appointed to a position and then later on at some point you find out that there was a prophecy a hundred years ago that named you and said you would be appointed to this position? You might be a little interested in that. You might think, what's going on here? And so Cyrus, he's convicted that, that this prophecy is about him, so he's determined to fulfill it. Now, some people will do this. They'll do this with Jesus, too. They'll say, well, Jesus did re just read the prophecies, and then he went about to fulfill them. And so it's not really that they were prophesying of him. He just made it look like they were. Well, that only works in certain situations. Like they'll bring up, you know, the fact that Jesus said um, on the night of the, the uh, Lord's Supper being instituted, the Passover, he says, go uh, into town and find a cult. And, and, and then I'll ride that into the city. And he did this because that was the prophecy about uh, uh, him entering into the city. <laughs> I've got that confused. I know. Uh, the triumphal entry of Jesus. You read about that in Luke. And uh, he does this. Uh, he talks about this entrance. And people say, well, he just orchestrated the events. Well, that's true. But there are prophecies that he had no control over. For example being born in the city of Bethlehem. Last time I checked, people cannot decide what city they're born in. That's just not something within your power. The manner of his death by crucifixion, having his hands and feet pierced, those are things he couldn't orchestrate. Now, when it comes to Cyrus, any old king, I guess, could have read that prophecy and said, I'm going to fulfill that prophecy and and make it about me, but he couldn't name himself. That's the one thing he couldn't do. And Isaiah goes to lengths to make it clear that God has called Cyrus by name. And so Cyrus declare, decrees that he will send the people of Israel back to Jerusalem. Now, uh, we get this... Um, 
we get this decree in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, uh, verses 22 through 23, where Cyrus uh, makes this known. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus of Persia so that he sent a herald throughout all his kingdom and also declared in a written edict, here's Cyrus's decree, thus says King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you all of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. So you see the timeline, you see the prophecy, you see its fulfillment here with King Cyrus's edict. Well, the next king who comes along is King Artaxerxes, and he's the king of Persia who reigns from about 465 BC to 425 BC. Cyrus, of course, was king during the first wave. Artaxerxes carries forward the decree of Cyrus and oversees the return of Jewish exiles under Ezra and Nehemiah. And I'm convinced to some extent that Artaxerxes also saw uh, his role in, in restoring the Jews to Israel as a part of this prophecy, that he was continuing on King Cyrus's work. But more than that, Artaxerxes was inspired by his friend, by his servant, by his cupbearer, Nehemiah. Nehemiah was such an important person in uh, King Artaxerxes' life that he was willing to, to essentially give him this amazing uh, mission and gift to go back and, and complete the city walls. Uh, now we read in, in Nehemiah chapter 1 that it's there in the city of Susa, the capital city that Artaxerxes is there. And, and Nehemiah is the cupbearer. Now what are the duties of the king's cupbearer? What are the duties of a cupbearer? Well, it was typically a high-ranking official, and they were basically responsible for serving the king his wine and food. Now, you might be thinking, thinking, well, so he's a waiter, right? That, that's, that's the big deal? Well, he's the waiter to the king. Now, you remember in the story of Joseph, when he's in prison, he has two, two uh, other inmates with him, a baker and a cupbearer. How did they end up in prison? Well, the cupbearer was accused of trying to poison the king. The baker and them had fallen under the, the uh, uh, disgrace of, of the king. And so there was this question, who could the king trust? I don't know. I'll just throw them both in prison. Now, eventually, they both get out. And you remember, it doesn't go so well for the baker, but the cupbearer gets restored to his high official position. This is such an important role with any kingdom because, of course, the king is under threat and he's worried about somebody trying to poison him. And so you want the person who's in charge of your food and wine to be someone you can trust. The cupbearer would even sometimes be called upon to test the wine and food. That's a pretty important person. Somebody who'd be willing to die for the king to be safe. And so the cupbearer had a lot of influence with the king since he had to be of utmost trustworthiness and character. And that character is evident throughout the book of Nehemiah. We see it unfolding. One of the great things about the book of Nehemiah is Nehemiah. He's such a personality. He's such a character. And he has character. The king trusts Nehemiah, not only because of his role as a cupbearer, but also because of his own personal characteristics. He he even gets the king's attention simply because, as we'll see in the coming weeks, simply because he has a sad face. The king says, what's up, Nehemiah? He cared about him. And as a result, Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem. Now, I just want to take a second and look at this first verse again. Uh, 
It says, Nehemiah is the son of Hekeliah. Now, sometimes we, we read these names in the Old Testament, we can hardly pronounce them, and we think, well, you know, I don't know what that's about, just strange names. But names in the Bible very often have meaning. Now, here in Nehemiah, the, the name Nehemiah means the Lord has comforted or the comfort of the Lord. And we can understand why, you know, a parent might name their child Nehemiah, the comfort of the Lord. But what's interesting is that Nehemiah's father's name is Hekeliah, which means the patience of the Lord or wait for the Lord. And so you have 70 years of captivity. It's very possible that Hekeliah was one of those who had been ripped from his homeland and taken into captivity and had heard the prophecy that they would be there for 70 years. And so while he's in Babylon, he's waiting for the Lord, as his name suggests. He's waiting for the Lord. What does the Bible say about waiting for the Lord? What if you were like those in Nehemiah's day who had, who had been taken from your homeland and you were brought to a, a foreign country, you were made to be a servant in some capacity, and you knew that the Lord was still with you, the Lord was going to deliver you, but not now. Right now, you have to wait. In Proverbs 8, verse 34, the Bible says, Blessed is the man who listens to me watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. Waiting involves two parts. Anticipation. Right? This man, this blessed man, he is looking out. He's standing by the posts of the doors. He's watching out by the gates to see when is the Lord going to come. He's anticipating the Lord's coming. He's anticipating the deliverance, the comfort of the Lord. But waiting also involves participation. So anticipation and participation. Anticipation is that longing for the Lord. Who here is longing for the Lord to come? Amen? Amen. Some days more than others, right? Amen. We long for him. We think, oh Lord, come. With John the Revelator, we say, come quickly, depending on the day. We anticipate the comfort of the Lord. Maybe you're going through an especially difficult time personally or your family is, or maybe you see the things going on in the world and you think, how long, O Lord, before you come? Can you imagine the people in exile in Babylon among all those pagans, God's people, the Jews, looking around thinking, how long is God going to leave us here in this terrible place? They were waiting for the Lord, longing for the Lord. But waiting also involves participation which means that we are not just longing for the Lord, but we're living for the Lord while we wait. Joshua marched seven times around the city walls of Jericho before the walls came tumbling down. Why did God make them do that? Why did God make them wait? Why seven times? Wouldn't one time around have sufficed? But they had to walk seven times around. Adrian Rogers says, God was teaching them that waiting time is not wasting time when it comes to our relationship with God. How many times do we struggle in that waiting because we don't know what God's up to, right? We wonder, what's he going to do? Why is he making us wait? And we get so focused on what we don't know that we stop doing the things we know to do. What if David's army had said, why do we have to wait seven days and walk around the city for seven times? I don't understand what this is all about. And they said, ah, forget it. I can't wait that long. Now, seven days ain't very long. Seventy years? That's a long time. Psalm 27, verse 14, the Bible says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Sometimes we get this idea that waiting means doing nothing. Now, when you go to a, a restaurant or a diner, 
and the person comes and takes your order, what do we call that person? The waiter, right? The waiter. Now, if your waiter isn't doing anything, what do you think? You're not too happy, are you? Where's my waiter? What are they doing? We confuse the idea of waiting with just sitting back and doing nothing. But biblically speaking, waiting involves anticipating and longing for the Lord and also participating and living for the Lord. Listen to what Isaiah says in verse 28, or chapter 28, verse 16. The prophet of God says, he who believes will not act hastily, or the New English translation says, the one who maintains his faith will not panic. Right? You're sitting around waiting, and you think, what are we going to do? I can't wait any longer. And our impatience leads to what? Anxiety and panic. There is nothing wrong with not knowing what's going to happen. There's nothing wrong with being concerned about the state and condition of things in our lives or in the world. But when we stop waiting for the Lord, then we have stepped out of faith. We want to anticipate and participate Now then, the comfort of God comes in Nehemiah's time, right? Not in Hakaliah's time. And that can be discouraging, of course, for uh, the generation of Hakaliah. They're the ones who had to endure the 70 years. But so often, one generation looks to the next to see what God's going to do, to see the joy restored to the people. You ask any parent what they want for their children. Well, they want better. They want better. They want things to improve. They want them to do well. They want to see them walking, as we talked about last Sunday, walking in truth. The comfort God brings comes in Nehemiah's time. And so it may be that what we're called to do is to wait and prepare for the comfort of the Lord to come Not in our generation, but in the next. Or in the next. Or in the one after that. And so Jesus sends out his disciples into the world and he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go into every nation and make disciples. Because the Lord is coming and he's going to come to bring his people home. But we don't know if he's coming tonight. And he might. And if he does, we're going to say, Hallelujah. But he might not come tomorrow or the day after that or a hundred years after that or a thousand years after that or 10,000 years after that. The Bible is very clear when the day of the Lord's coming is, it will be as a thief in the night when you do not expect. So what do we do while we wait? Go, make disciples, preach the gospel, Live for the Lord now. So when the Lord comes, he finds us waiting. The requirement of waiting in Hakaliah's time is sometimes the biggest challenge in the Christian life. Waiting for the Lord means that we're called to wait for his comfort. Life is not all about, uh, as a Christian, it's not all about Uh, a a rose-strewn path. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be pitfalls. There's going to be times when we suffer for Christ's sake. There's going to be times when we don't know when the comfort of the Lord is coming because it's not now. We have to wait. It means waiting for his rescue and his deliverance. Anyone who knows the joy of salvation, that hope of eternal life, is longing to realize it. Peter talks about when Jesus comes again, he says, and so we shall receive such an entrance into the kingdom. We all want that day. We long for it. But now we must wait. And of course, we wait for him to come. 
and to make all things new as he promised to do. So don't give up. Don't give up because what you're waiting for hasn't arrived. Don't give up because waiting seems to uh, be difficult in the present. Maybe you're in the first trip around Jericho. Can you imagine being the guy who walked around Jericho six times and said, that's it, I'm out. You don't want to be that one. You don't want to throw in the towel before the Lord comes. Maybe you are in the sixth trip around and you're, you're almost there. Don't give up. I want to read with you a final uh, passage of Scripture from Paul's letter to Titus. Titus, the young preacher, in chapter 2, beginning there in verse 11, Paul says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He it is who gave himself for us that, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. What do we do while we wait? Well, we get on fire for God. And we start living for him now so that when he comes and he brings his comfort, we're ready. Nehemiah had learned from his father, Hakaliah, what God needed in him to be trustworthy, to be a person of character, to respond to God's calling and grace. So that when he had the opportunity to return back to Jerusalem and to rebuild that wall, Nehemiah was the man of the hour. He was ready. I don't know what God has in store for you. You may be in Hakaliah's generation. You may be the one waiting and preparing. You might be in Nehemiah's generation. You may be called to do something for the Lord that you're not even aware of. But the question is, are we the kind of people? The kind of people who are waiting for the Lord. Let's pray together. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you for the grace that you've shown us in Jesus Christ that teaches us to set aside the, the sin and ungodliness of this world because we are waiting for something so much better. There's nothing that this world offers us, Father, that is better than what you've given us in Jesus. And help us as we wait in, in anticipation for that glory Help us to stay focused, keep our eyes at the gate as we stand by the posts of the door. And Father God, may we participate and not simply sit idle. May we be zealous for good works. May we make our lives reflect your glory each day, anticipating when you call us to rise up and to be with you. We ask this all for the sake of your son's name, Jesus, and, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.